In this lecture presentation, we're going to look at AC fundamentals. So we are going to look at alternating current and alternating voltage. And we're going to look at how we would describe those and, um, and also write them as functions of time. So alternating voltage and current are basically values that don't stay um, constant with respect to time. And not only that, they also switch from being positive to negative and positive to negative and back and forth again. And they, they do that with some um, cycle to them. So they do repeat. So in the first picture up here, we have a sinusoidal varying um, value. It could be voltage or current. And so sometimes the voltage is positive or the current. Sometimes it's negative, and then it repeats back to positive and negative. But it does it in a sinusoidal way. Other types of waveforms that are AC would be a square wave where the, the value is positive and constant, but then all of a sudden it switches to negative and constant and then repeats back to positive and constant. And then another sample would be a triangular wave where it slowly, um, say it's negative and then it slowly decreases to zero and then it increases to a positive value and then decreases and so on. And so this, um, again, it changes polarity. So sometimes the values are positive and sometimes the values are negative. If you have a sinusoidal varying voltage, then you obviously also have a sinusoidal varying current and vice versa. So when we're talking about AC, we're really talking about alternating voltage and current. So here's a picture of one cycle of a voltage supply that's oscillating like a sine wave. And so it starts off with uh, zero volts, and then the polarity increases in a sinusoidal way, decreases back to zero, increases but becomes negative, and then decreases again back to zero. And so at this particular point, if I were to continue to look at what the voltage is doing as a function of time, it would start to repeat itself. So we're looking at a single cycle of that uh, voltage supply that's AC. So when we're looking at alternating voltage and current, we have to define some conventions when we're dealing with them. And so uh, over here, we have a picture that represents uh, a voltage supply that's sinusoidally varying in time. We've written down a positive side and a negative side. And we've also drawn this picture, this schematic, with a uh, sinusoidal varying waveform. So if it was a square wave or a triangular wave, the picture inside here would be different. But again, we're, we're going to focus on sinusoidal varying voltage supplies and current, and current sources, as well as how the current and the voltage change with respect to time. So in this particular picture, we have to label positive and negative, and all that means is that at time t equal to zero, this represents the polarity that this side over here is positive and this one is negative. And, uh, but as it goes through its cycles, the polarity will actually change and flip so that the one side will be negative and the other side will be positive. But, um, but again, this is a reference. So this represents the state that it's in at time t equal to 0. So after we assign that reference frame, we could also assign a current direction according to the, the voltage supply. And of course, we're using the conventional current. So in my picture over here, where I have an alternating voltage supply connected up with a resistor, there would be current that runs through this circuit. And the current, of course, would also be sinusoidally varying because of this resistor connected. And the current direction would be in the conventional current direction. And that would be true if, um, if the voltage supply started off at time t equal to 0, and it had 0 volts, and then it increased and then decreased back to 0. So for the first half of the cycle, the current direction is as indicated, and the polarity is indicated this way. But after the first half of the cycle, the polarity of the voltage supply switches. And so the polarities would switch, and the current direction would be in the opposite direction. So this is what's actually happening over time. But this would be our schematic picture that we would look at, understanding that the polarities flip as time goes on. 
So how do we actually generate alternating current and alternating voltage? One way that we can do that is we can think about Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. And so we could have a constant um, magnet that has a north pole on one side. And of course, there's more to this magnet over here that would be a south end. And then we can take another magnet, permanent magnet, that has its south end here, and then the north end would be somewhere over here. And if we put a coil in between those magnets, and we use mechanical energy to physically rotate this coil between these magnets, there is a flux of the magnetic field through the coil. And right now in this particular picture, I have the maximum amount of flux because those magnetic field lines are going directly through the coil. And then as I mechanically rotate that coil through, the magnetic field lines don't pass through the coil anymore, they pass over it, so the flux has reduced to zero. And any time I have a change in the flux, I get induced voltage. And so we could continue this and rotate this coil around. And if we rotate the coil around at a constant angular speed, then the results will be that I get out an alternating voltage because of that flux alternating between being a maximum, a minimum, and then the flux changing direction and then going back to zero, I can actually get an alternating voltage induced in across that coil which can light up the light bulb. If we spin this fast enough, the light bulb will always be lit up. So we need to go back and think a little bit about sinusoidally varying functions. And we need to realize that when something uh, repeats itself, that it has some period associated with it. And so the period is just the time to complete one cycle. So if I were to make a plot of the voltage or the current as a function of time, I could find the period by looking at the distance between successive peaks and going down on the time axis and measuring what that time is to go from one peak to the next peak. Any time measurement that measures one complete cycle would be the period. So I could also start here at the origin and I could follow this until it starts this waveform starts to repeat itself again and that would also be one period. And I could pick any random point on there and as long as I measure one complete cycle before the wave completes itself, it starts to repeat itself, then that would be one cycle. So we measure the period, we write it as a capital T, it's measured in seconds, although we will see milliseconds on our um, homework, but we have to keep in mind what those units, the normal traditional units would be for se is our seconds. We also might be interested in the frequency, which is essentially the number of cycles that occur every second that goes by. So the period and the frequency are inversely, inversely, inversely related to one another. And we've seen this before in some other uh, physics classes that we have taken. So, um, so we want to keep that in mind as well. So if we went back to our previous example, the frequency would be how many times per second we're actually rotating that coil in the magnetic field. As we look at sinusoidal varying waveforms, we have to also define some other quantities that are associated with that waveform other than the period and the frequency. So one thing that we can define is the amplitude of the wave, which is basically just the distance from the average value of the sine wave to its peak. So my average value in my first picture here is zero, and the distance from zero up to the peak is our, um, is our amplitude of the wave. And we could also measure from the peak, um, from the zero value down to the, to the lowest point on here. So we always put a subscript on there, uh, M, to represent the fact that that's the, the maximum value, essentially. Um, in our waveform, and, um, and that's our amplitude. We might also be interested in our peak-to-peak -peak value, which is basically just the distance from the maximum value to the minimum value. 
and we would write that as EP dash P for the peak to peak value, or we could don't have to put the dash in there as well. We keep in mind that um, here we're using E because this could be a source um, of the voltage supply, and we use E's to represent sources. But we could also use a V if we're just measuring the voltage across the resistor or a capacitor or inductor. If a sine wave is actually superimposed on DC, it can cause the sine wave to be shifted up. So in other words, if we took an AC source and then we added to it a DC source, so they were in series, the overall effect would be that the source would still oscillate in time, or, or the, the, the voltage would still oscillate in time, but it would be shifted so that it doesn't necessarily have to be zero. So here's a picture of that where I have some DC source, E, and then I attach to it also a, a sinusoidal varying voltage supply. So this one actually never becomes negative, but it is oscillating with respect to time. Another important uh, quantity that we're going to be interested in as we talk about sinusoidal varying waveforms is something called the angular frequency or the angular velocity. It's, it's better termed angular frequency. And the angular frequency is basically just looking at, if we go back to that generator example, what is the angular velocity with which we'd have to rotate that, that coil in the magnetic field? And so by definition, the angular velocity or the angular frequency is the angular distance covered in a time of one period. And so one cycle, of course, is taking that coil and rotating it around um, one complete time. So the distance covered angularly is 360 degrees, which is equivalent to 2 pi. And then the time it takes to complete that cycle is a period. So the angular frequency is 2 pi over the period. And since one of the period is the frequency, it can also be written as 2 pi times the frequency. So the units that we use for angular frequency are radians per second. And so we have to be very careful when we're doing calculations because, of course, we're used to using degrees oftentimes. And here we're going to have to really be careful uh, when we're combining both degrees and radians, and we'll see that soon. A frequency, of course, is measured in cycles per second, which is hertz and our period is measured in seconds, and those are the standard units that we would use.